Daniel, take it away. Hello, uh, I'm Daniel Fortuno with Benefits Education Center, and I'm getting to do this evening what I love the most, which is to teach. Uh, I am a benefits nerd, and I enjoy all things in the world of dysfunctional benefits. They don't make any common sense, uh, and it's a matter of understanding a dysfunctional system and knowing how it works. Uh, and also getting that things change. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and start. And the way I've decided to go through this evening's uh, presentation um, is to, you know, start giving some background information because not everybody uh, understands the different programs and they get them incorrectly all the time. So hold on, I'm trying to get my, there we go. So the first thing when you deal with benefits, you've got to learn the acronyms. If I say SSA benefit, that's like saying I have a soda. It could be a Coke, it could be a 7-Up, it could be a Sprite, but I'm not talking about what program. SSA stands, why isn't this working? Here we go. For Social Security Administration. So if you say SSA, you're talking about the administration and not a particular program. The next acronym, oh, I'm not doing this right, here we go, is uh, SSDI, which stands for Social Security Disability Insurance. And finally, uh, SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. Uh, you're gonna find when you deal with entities, many times people will speak to you in what I call acronyms and not be clear that you're both talking about the same thing. It's not uncommon that I know of families that'll call up and talk about SSI uh, and their child actually isn't on SSI, they've transitioned or on a, uh, SSDI. Now, when it comes to these two coverages, the SSI program uh, comes with Medi-Cal automatically in the state of California. That's not true in all states. In other states, Medi-Cal is called Medicaid. Uh, some states, when I have clients that move, you know, we transition their SSI over, and then we may have to do an additional application for that state's Medicaid. Those are the health coverage programs that come with uh, the, uh, the two SSI program or Social Security programs, there I did it, uh, that uh, we're going to be talking about. Now the SSDI program is the one we're going to be focusing on today. And SSDI benefits can be uh, received based on the individual's contribution, the contribution of a parent, uh, also known, uh, the benefit program is called uh, Childhood Disabled Beneficiary Program, which we commonly refer to as Disabled Adult Child DAC, and a widow or widower can be eligible for this program. Now, in classic Social Security style, uh, they come up with a name for a program, and somewhere they decide they're going to change the law. So they change the name of the program, and in some of the literature, uh, it's referred to as I just mentioned, Childhood Disabled Beneficiary, CDB. Uh, but the old term, pre the era of person-centered, uh, was Disabled Adult Child. The problem is, is nobody uses CDB. So when you talk to somebody at Social Security, if you, you know, say childhood disabled beneficiary, they may or may not know what you're talking about, even though there was a change in the rules to change the name. So that's not uncommon. So be aware, you may be talking about a program that's had a name change, but I've gone back to just calling it disabled adult child, DAC. So how does a DAC program work? Well, the disabled adult child uh, is Social Security benefit uh, for an individual if uh, they have a disability that's approved between 18 prior to age 22. And approved means they have records that support the disability, not diagnosed. Everybody, when it comes to Social Security, gets the term diagnosis and actually disability approved confused. You can have a diagnosis 
of stage four cancer and one person may be able to work and another one is totally disabled. Everybody's symptomology and how that particular diagnosis presents itself is different and the medical record is the only way that social security understands what's going on. The exception as an example would be an individual who meets social security's definition of being legally blind. But for the most part, all conditions, it's never a diagnosis alone. It's a diagnosis. And how does it present itself? And does it meet the criteria between the ages of 18 and prior to 22 for the individual to get to be transitioned to the disabled adult child program? Now, the child will get a benefit when a parent is eligible and they have met the definition of disability. Eligible means mom or dad retires, they become disabled according to Social Security and they're receiving Social Security disability insurance benefits, or the parent has passed away. Those are the three types of events uh, that make a parent to consider to be eligible for a disabled adult child. Now, at disability or retirement of the parent, the child's going to be eligible to receive an amount that's half of what the parent's benefit would be. So 50% of what mom and dad, mom or dad are entitled to, whoever's the highest wage earner, is the amount the individual, uh, the disabled adult child will receive. Uh, and it doesn't come out of the parent's benefit. So, you know, uh, example, uh, dad is eligible for $3,000 because he became disabled from uh, Social Security Disability Insurance. And Susan, his daughter, is now eligible, uh, who's met the definition of disability between 18 prior to 22 for $1,500. And it's, you know, their own benefit that they're entitled to. Uh, upon death of the parent, the child receives an amount that's equal to three quarters of the parent's benefit. Now, a lot of people think that, well, when I retire, my child's automatically going to be put in this program, and it doesn't happen. You, you, There's an application process, and even if your child was on SSI in that window of time, you have to get Social Security to pull the records and make sure they still have the record. That's why I tell parents, when you're working on getting a child approved, save the records. You may have to represent them during, uh, you know, for DAC eligibility at uh, disability retirement or the death of a parent. Now, an important note is, um, and this is where people have challenges, shall we say. If the earnings before SSDI DAC eligibility are greater than substantial gainful activity, the beneficiary could lose future eligibility. So what do I mean? So you have uh, uh, Lisa, and Lisa is an SSI beneficiary, and Lisa is working part-time, and she's making $1,500 a month, and it doesn't eliminate all her SSI, uh, and that's what she's doing, and then dad retires. You've got all the medical evidence, but now when you look at the record, based on my example, she has earned greater than substantial gainful activity. And by earning greater than substantial gainful activity, prior to becoming a disabled adult child, that potentially puts you in a place where you lose eligibility for future DAC benefits. And mind you, substantial gainful activity is a dollar amount. You can see for 2023 and last year it was 1350. So it varies depending upon the year. So, and that's gross income before taxes. So it's really important uh, that if an individual is doing work activity is an SSI beneficiary before the parents um, retire, become disabled or pass away, uh, that you're aware of the fact that earning SGA can be a problem. Now, how do we deal with that? Because there's always a solution. Um, there is what's called work subsidy. And work subsidy is a way that you can reduce the value, not the actual amount of earnings, but the value of the earnings to have it drop below substantial gainful activity 
for disabled adult child eligibility. So basically what's happening is they're reducing the value of the wages with a subsidy for special conditions. So an employer may subsidize the earnings of an employee with a serious medical condition, and this is part of the Social Security's wording, um, by providing what's called an employer subsidy, non-specific subsidy, special condition subsidy. So these terms are terms of art they use, and the way that it is captured is by completing a form, um, and the form is the SSA 3033, and that form allows the employer to document what special situations are going on that impacts the individual's performance, the productivity, uh, and even an unsuccessful work attempt. So what we're talking about now is how do we capture a subsidy when we may have an individual who's working with a disability, but they have uh, a job coach, or they're given less duties than other people, or you know they have <coughs> excuse me they have special uh, accommodations that need to be captured on this particular form and provided to social security so that their wages can be looked at and be viewed as less than sga now this does not impact the amount the wages have on ssi benefits because that is in a different presentation that we'll be doing on how work impacts SSI benefits. What this subsidy does is whenever you have the situation where Social Security is looking at substantial gainful activity, which can be in multiple places in Social Security when you're dealing with benefits, it reduces the value of those wages by the amount of subsidy that's provided. So, uh, Social Security will give a value based on that form of the subsidy and reduce the value of the wages by anywhere from 50% down to zero. I literally had an employer that filled out a form and says, we don't do anything to accommodate them. They're just as good as anybody else. They're like any other employee and they got zero. Even though the reality was the employer was accommodating the individual, but they were concerned, you know, of what negative impacts that would have for them as an employer. So be aware that individuals um, who work at a company who would be filling out the form need to understand that there's not going to be a negative impact for them providing this accommodation and formalizing it on the form. Daniel. People are asking, is the income gross or net? It's always gross. Thank Whenever you. we deal with Social Security, we're always dealing with gross amount income before taxes. It's never what you take home. And they look at the actual amount you're making in a calendar month. Thank you. One other follow-up on the subsidy. What if the employer refuses to complete the form or discharge <laughs> the client for not performing? If, if the employer doesn't fill out the form, you don't have a subsidy. You have to have an employer do it. Yeah, you and the employers are not obligated by law to do it. So Thank that you. becomes having a conversation with the employer, letting them know it's not going to have a negative impact because that's what I've had be a challenge in the past. So the example I'm going to give is Rita, who works at Walmart and she earns $2,000 a month. Uh, she has a job coach that goes in with her daily, and Social Security grants her a subsidy of 50%. So granting her a subsidy at 50% means that they're only going to look at 50% of her wages. So even though she's earning $2,000, when it comes to them looking at SGA, substantial gainful activity, wherever she is, whether she's just going on benefits or dealing with, with you know, future issues, it reduces the value of her wages in this example by 50%. Um, now, something that a lot of people have been asking me, and it's interesting how questions go in waves, 
uh, if a DAC individual marries, uh, the DAC benefits will only continue if they marry another DAC beneficiary. So if, if David wants to marry Lisa, and David is a DAC and Lisa's on SSI, he'll lose his DAC benefits. So it's got to be DAC for DAC if the individual chooses to get married. Um, oops, I got a repeated slide. Okay, continuing disability reviews. Both SSDI and SSI, as many of you know, have continuing disability reviews. There are two types of continuing disability reviews. There is medical based on a, a Social Security diary date. Whenever you're granted Social Security, whether it's SSI or SSDI, they do what's called, they grant a diary date or they determine a diary date. And that diary date is anywhere from one to seven years. And during that time period, they they'll they'll go ahead and decide to review the record and in reviewing the record what they're evaluating is has there been enough improvement to where this individual is no longer disabled at the standard that they were and the biggest problems individuals and families have at this point um is that maybe there's a diagnosis and then there's good medical records and the case gets granted, but there's no change going on. So you don't see the doctor for two years and your medical record has nothing in them. So if there is no record, that in itself, because there's no treatment is considered to be an improvement. So it's really important. I tell people minimally get your medical record documented every six months, minimally, and I say that especially to individuals that live with disability that don't require that they see the doctor that often, but this way they can still capture the limitations that the individual has. So when the case is reviewed, they're still showing disabled at the same level. There's work continuing disability reviews, and that's based on earning. So I'll be doing a presentation in May for Parents Helping Parents on how work impacts SSI, which is a whole set of rules for that, and then how work impacts SSDI. And remember, SSDI can be as an individual's contribution or on the disabled adult child that we're talking about now. Now, um, when just to give you a brief overview, uh, when a person is granted under the disabled adult child, child and they choose to work or they work, there are, and I'm not going to get into details, but giving you big picture, uh, the rules that continue to be in place, which are the nine trial work months, the 36 month extended period of eligibility, the three grace months, there is the five year expedited reinstatement. So those rules still exist. For a DAC. Now, be aware a lot of parents think, oh, I'm going to get my child on Social Security benefits and we're going to get them a job, you know, and then they're going to have the Social Security income, whether it's SSI or SSDI, plus their wages, you know, and things are, well, no. The program is designed for individuals that are unable to work for at least a year or more. So you have first have to meet that definition. If you start working within that first year of being granted, there's a likelihood they're going to say, wait a second, we made a mistake. This person is earning substantial gainful activity, you know, and they don't have a uh, work subsidy. You know, maybe we made a mistake and I've seen it happen. OK, let's go into public health coverage. Um, when it, uh, Medicare and we're going to talk about Medi-Cal, which I mentioned before is uh, California's Medicaid program. So Medicare eligibility, the SSI, SSDI beneficiary, until it's late, I'm starting to lose my acronyms. Uh, there's a 24 month waiting period, okay? So for Medicare, it is not automatic. It's not right away. It's from when they deem your disability starts as a 24 month waiting period. Uh, and that is for the individual. 
or for the child with the uh, dis, uh, childhood disabled beneficiary and a disabled widow or widower. So that doesn't go away. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of Medicare's part A, B, C, and D. That's a different training. Uh, but uh, Medicare is after 24 months. Now, the continuance of Medicare, once somebody is on disabled adult child, will continue as long as they're eligible for the SSDI benefit as a disabled adult child. Um, and then there are certain rules on how long that Medicare will continue. When I do my work presentation, uh, we'll get into that. Okay, uh, let's briefly talk about Medi-Cal. Well, here's some examples of how an individual is going to qualify for Medi-Cal in the state of California when they live with a disability. So there's SSI-based, age-disabled federal poverty level, share of costs, there's a breast and cervical cancer treatment, and the California Working Disabled Program. When an individual has been on SSI in the state of California, as long as they're eligible for or a dollar or more of SSI in California, they are automatically enrolled in Medi-Cal. And that Medi-Cal continues as long as they continue to be eligible for SSI. Well, what happens to our DAC benefit person when their uh, DAC benefits make them ineligible for uh, SSI? Well, what occurs is there's a Social Security provision which is called 1634C. And when I call Social Security, it's very few workers who even know the rules and I have to get them, point them to the rule book and you know that kind of thing. And basically it says SSI ends due to being eligible uh, for SSDI as a disabled adult child. Then what occurs is they, they if the individual continues to be eligible or, or seem to be eligible other than the SSDI income for the SSI requirement, they get to keep Medi-Cal at no cost. So you have to stay below the SSI income limitations. And now this is new information courtesy of an Amy Tesler. And I don't know if you're out there tonight, but Amy Tesler was kind enough to send me an email. She's with the Dale Law Firm and she sent me an email asking me the question, um, previously SSI 1634C, myself and other experts believed that even though in the state of California, the resources went up to 130,000, because it's an SSI provision, it stayed at 2,000, and she made me aware of an all-county letter. And when it comes to the world of Medi-Cal, they communicate by what are called all county letters. And she provided me with a copy of one that now shows in the state of California, uh, an SSI recipient who loses SSDI or, an S or who loses SSI because of SSDI in California can have up to 130,000 in resources. So the $2,000 limitation that existed previously is no longer there. You're still allowed up to one house, one car. And, you know, the part that was so confusing about this provision is that the law reads that if you continue to be eligible other than your income and meet other eligibility requirements for the SSI program, your Medicaid, because they use it's a national term, uh, is continued and you stay on SSI linked Medicaid uh, indefinitely, regardless of how high your income goes. Now, the reason why this is important, it is not uncommon when somebody should be transitioning to this type of Medi-Cal that a Medi-Cal worker will push the wrong button or let's just say, let's just put them on Magi Medi-Cal. Magi Medi-Cal is from the Obama bill where it opened it up for uh, Medicaid's and California Medi-Cal to allow individuals who are not disabled to enroll in Medi-Cal uh, and they don't care about the resources of the individual and it's just income-based. Well, that's fine and well for the moment, 
But if you're put on the wrong type of Medi-Cal and don't get put on the correct type of Medi-Cal, when the individual's parents died, it could be a problem because their, their income is going to go up significantly, and that's their unearned income from Social Security Disability Insurance. So what I typically do when I deal with Medi-Cal is I verify the aid code. You first got to spend two hours to get through the Medi-Cal. And then once you get the through to someone, you make sure that they know it's the uh, BIC aid code of six, C as in Charlie, for disabled adult child. And they'll either be able to fix it or have to speak to a supervisor or put you on hold until they find somebody that can explain it to them. But you really want to have this corrected in place. So the key thing, everything we've talked about brings us to this slide. When you transition from SSI to disabled adult child, to keep the Medi-Cal, you should have a beneficiary identification code of 6C as in Charlie. And with that said, I'll take questions. All right, well, several questions uh, came through. Do you wanna stop sharing your screen, Daniel? And um, that way you can see people, they can see you better. Okay, you give me a second. I gotta figure out how to do this. Just bingo on the first try. Okay, now All I right. Does, okay, does the $130,000 limit also apply for SSI or only for SSDI and DAC? No, the, the 130,000 has zero connection to SSI. Okay, so the 130,000, everybody thinks, oh, well, it changed for Medi-Cal. Uh, then did it change for SSI? It did not change. The reason why your handout is different than what I have, and fortunately what Amy gave me, was I learned that it applies when you have a DAC eligible for Medi-Cal only. Thank you. How does this apply to parents who are getting teacher pensions? Uh, there's no connection. A teacher pension, um, are, you, are you talking about a disabled adult child teacher? Okay. My understanding is that many teachers stop paying into Social Security and pay into a teacher's retirement. Okay. You have to have money in the Social Security system and be eligible for SS uh, for Social Security based on disability, retirement, or debt. So if it depends on how many years you paid into the teacher system, and if you divested, if you would, my term, into Social Security retirement system, uh, it, it really depends. And I have parents who retired as teacher who the child's only eligible for SSI because they stopped paying into uh, Social Security many years ago. Thank you. Um, if a retired parent's monthly Social Security is less than the disabled adult's SSI, does SSI continue? Okay, so let me, under, may, let me make sure I'm understanding the question right. So are we saying, is the, dis, if, the amount that the child's eligible as a DAC is under the current $1,133.73 of SSI, yes, that child could continue to receive SSI. That's if the parent's monthly social security is less than the disabled adults. But I think the answer is the, the same. Parents, the parent's social security will always be greater than child because child's getting an amount that's 50% of what mom or dad gets or 75% at the death of the parent. So there would never be a situation where the child gets more than what the parents get. But if they, they're still gonna be, let's say the parent's only gonna get $900 because maybe they didn't work a lot, um, $900 a month. So the child will get 450, but then SSI will supplement that. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. It would make the difference up because uh, it's a supplementing program. So, yes, I'm sorry I misunderstood the Thank question. You. And for whoever was confused and asked about Medicaid, it's what every other state calls Medi-Cal. 
All right. Most other states. Most Some states. states have pro, they call it access. <laughs> well, they, yeah, California likes to put that that cal in there and same with conservatorship and guardianship if you're here from another state it's guardianship if you're in California it's conservatorship I have another question my son has down syndrome and I am retiring in a few months he currently gets SSI and Medi-Cal but I want him to get on Medicare how do I do this okay the only way Medicare is available is if he has a work history paying into Social Security or gets a benefit based on the parent's contribution and receives Social Security as a disabled adult child for 24 months. So you as a parent would have to either be retired disabled uh, and the child would receive, um, they would receive a benefit in after 24 months and only after that period of time would they be eligible for Medicare. Thank you. Can uh, you define what you mean by a diagnosis after 18 and before 22? And I ne I, I ne it's never diagnosis. That's not the word we use. We want medical records that support disability. So as an example, you can have an in individual uh, that has, uh, you know, autism, and I, I'm not remembering all my terms of art right now, but autism at a very significant level, let's say, just, you know, to where, you know, they have difficulty speaking, so on and so forth. If all that evaluation goes on prior to age 18, uh, it's not used other than history. It has to be after the age of 18. And that would be after the age of 18, where it's documented what specifically are the limitations of that individual. So then Social Security can look and say, oh, I see what limitations you're dealing with. Oh, nope, there's you're, you're disabled. You can't work. Now, the challenge is also making sure that those records uh, are before age 22 for the disabled adult child. I literally have had people who have gotten all of the diagnostic and evaluations done at age 23, and there's no evidence prior to age 22, and there's no disabled adult child benefit for them. Thank you. So time is of the essence, timing matters. And holding your records is not quantity of records, it's quality. Example, if you get a neuropsych eval, which to me it's a gold standard, of evaluating dif uh, disabilities, you know, you want to get an evaluation. You, you know, if if you're looking at doing it at age 16, 17, you're better off doing it at age 18 and holding it and maintaining it so that when you as a parent retire, then you have the evidence there and there's no question. Thank you. One person asked that this person does not work. And when her husband retires or his husband retires, we have to transition our son to SSDI, question mark. So I think the better question might be is how do they initiate the process of disabled adult child benefits? Do they call so someone? So there's up? a whole application process for disabled adult child. And it's uh, an SSA-4. Uh, SSA-4 uh, is the name of the actual application. And what you do is you put in the application and you give the details uh, of the individual, then they process it and they do a medical review. Um, you're given the opportunity to provide records in the what I call the sweet spot or the window of time that they need. Um, or if the child is uh, over 18 and before 22, then it would be current records. And it's all about the clarity of the records. It's never a diagnosis. All right, next question. Um, and I'm gonna ask this collectively because there's been several comments about it. Family maximum. Many of our families have more than one child that will be eligible for DAC benefits. Okay, so Social Security in implemented a rule which they called the family maximum. And everybody's family maximum is different. So Social Security is gonna predetermine what is the maximum all the individuals in that household under that one record holder 
uh, are going to be eligible to receive. So they'll reduce what you're entitled to so that the combination of all of the people, and whenever I say a number holder, that's the term that they use to the primary social security that the benefits are all under. Thank you. What is the pickle amendment? Okay, pickle is, I, I, it's of all things, I remember to hearing that, you know, some 30 years ago. Pickle basically is, it's a lawsuit. And basically what it does, it allows them to, via the pickle amendment, maintain uh, an individual's Medi-Cal coverage while they correctly evaluate what the individual qualified for. And with Medi-Cal, especially with COVID, people are all over the place in the types of Medi-Cal they've been put on. Um, and then pickle is not supposed to be permanent. Uh, and I'll have people on pickle for years, you know, and, and the way the law was, or the way the lawsuit and the law thereafter was written, uh, basically it, it allows them to put you on a temporary uh, Medi-Cal till an official evaluation comes about. Now, often I hear them call pickle uh, as an example, when somebody was on SSI and had SSDI, and the SSDI went too high, they often are put on what's called pickle, which my understanding to the law is not correct, but I see it go on for years. Thank you. All right. Uh, do you know anything about SSI 1619B can stay on Medi-Cal if SSI benefits ends because making too much money? Okay, now we're talking the work rules, okay? So 1619B, <coughs> excuse me, is an SSI provision under the work rule. And basically what it's saying is that if an individual has so much wages that the SSI is wiped out, we're not talking DAC, we're not talking SGA, we're talking about after they do, and I'll give you a quick explanation, what's called the countable income calculation, if the wages are so great that it eliminates uh, the SSI, uh, the Medi-Cal will continue under a provision which is called 1619B, and I don't have the actual number for this year in front of me of how much 1619B maximum is for this calendar year. Thank you. Uh, and a question from the lovely and helpful Amy who uh, provided you that information, she is here. Uh, her son made over SGA for two months when he was 24. The employer completed a subsidy report and it is in his file. It won't be needed until we retire. Other than those two months, he has always been below SGA. The subsidy report along with the submitted IRWEs and, and yeah, that stands for impairment SGA. related there... work expenses. Thank okay. you. And SGA is, it's, why don't we recap SGA as well? Does she need to do anything else? Make sure you got records for the right time. Make sure you have those 18 prior to 22 records in place. Thank so that's you. the key thing. You know, parents, you know, years go on and Johnny's been on disability you know, since he was age 18 and 20 years down the road, I retire and the records are gone. You know, the records are the key thing. Find the records, make sure you have the records, maintain them. I recommend that, you know, you, you have a paper file. If you're going to maintain paper on uh, a beneficiary or your child, I recommend a binder, not file folders. Because when you do file folders, you create and all of a sudden you're three inches in a file folder and you've mixed all your programs. And if you do a binder, you separate out, you know, what's medical, what's Medi-Cal, what's SSI, what's SSDI, you know, and the the this way you always have at your fingertips are easy to access anything you need. We do have a binder and everything is got a tag to let you know what the topic is because I'm the only parent who does supports, and I think that's critical. And we get reports from San Jose State on communication, which does a whole 
assessment um, every, well, twice a year. So those assessments came in really helpful when it was time for us to do that. We sent those in, we sent in other recent reports along with her application. So it, it can't be understated how important that is and hanging on to that stuff. Um, it, okay. it allows you to be in a position of power. So that you're you're not like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? It's like, oh, here it is. Yeah. You it, need it a second time, I'll fax it to you a second time. Yes. It reduced the stress significantly when I did that application. All right, we have several more questions. I want to keep going. If a parent claims a disabled adult child on their taxes who gets SSI, will being claimed on his parents' taxes affect his SSI? No, I'm not a tax person. But when it comes to SSI, I am aware that just because an individual is claimed as a uh, as a dependent, it has no negative impact. Thank you. Um, is there an advantage to filing under my son's father's SS number opposed to mine? Is there more money taken from parents? Yeah. Whoever's the highest wage earners, where your benefit is, and Thank I'll have some parents where a parent will retire and then the higher wage earner retires later and then they just adjust it. You know, so we go under the first parents retired and then once the second parent retires, then we, we adjust it again. All right, I think I have a repetitive question, but just in case I wanna ask this for this person. My son is on SSI, SSA and SSI because his dad is retired. Should he be on a different arrangement? He lives at home with us, receives eleven twenty-five a month. Should he be on DAB? He is on Medicaid and Medicare. Okay, so there is no such thing as SSA. That's the name of the program. And if you're saying it's based on a parent, then that is actually disabled adult child benefit. And the SSI is supplementing because the amount the child is receiving based on that parent's record is low enough that they still qualify for the SSI program. Now, mind you, if, you're, if your child's income goes up so high where they lose the eligibility for SSI because the SSDI as a DAC has taken them over, you're in a good place. You have more money. You know, SSI is payer of last resort. It's a supplementer. It's designed to supplement based on need, and it's not geographic need. It's based, you know, in the state of California, every state is different, and every state determines, you know, to the federal amount if they're going to add to the pot, and it's there to supplement, um, you know, up to whatever your state amount is. Thank you. This comes up a lot. I get this question frequently from people. So I think it's worth covering even though nobody's asked it. I want to know how can they keep Medi-Cal as the primary and not use Medicare because it's more complicated for them? Okay. Medi-Cal is payer of last resort. Um, so whenever you have another health coverage, such as Medicare, it'll be primary. It will always be primary. So if you have private health insurance, which I recommend, if you have the ability to maintain that for an adult child, do it because you have more choices, um, you know, for providers that may not accept Medi-Cal. But there's no way to make Medi-Cal primary over Medicare. Thank you. Um, what is the Medicaid code for SSI associated Medicaid or Medi-Cal, not DAC? Whoa, whoa, say that again, I'm sorry. Is, is there a special code for SSI associated Medicaid or Medi-Cal? That's not- uh, I don't have it memorized. The, the, the SSI, um, because the SSI division, hold on, I'm gonna- look at my cheat sheet here, and I don't know the aid code off the top of my head. It has to exist. I'm gonna ask the next question. Maybe um, it'll come to you while we're asking. I don't have it memorized, so it's not common to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the cheat sheet. Okay. 
Well, we still have an hour. We have 14 more questions. So hopefully. Okay. So I, I don't have the answer to that. So I don't know what the A code is. Uh, because typically, when I call Medi-Cal, if somebody is SSI linked and it's not through the Disabled Adult Child Program, they don't have the ability to see what's going on. Yeah, it's a nightmare when you start trying to figure that out. It's a difficult situation. But the hardest part being the workers may or may not know yes. what you're talking about of their program. Absolutely. All right. What if... Okay, I think this question is, can a child qualify for more than SSI? And I'm wondering, this is talking about retirement. So I think you mean social security income. Um, the payments on the parent, what if the other parent was perhaps in a position of receiving a pension from another employer or, you know, can they collect from both? Okay, so... When it comes to the disabled adult child program, they're going to select the highest wage earner and they're going to pay a benefit off of that wage earner. If that employer or the the if the parent has money in state teachers or a private entity, none of that comes into play unless those particular programs have a provision to cover uh, a disabled adult child program. But can That's they collect from two sources without huh? affecting their benefits. So if the pension does have provisions for a disabled adult child, can the disabled adult person receive pension related benefits as well as social security benefits? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. There's, there's the disabled adult child program is um, basically Social Security Disability Insurance is basically what it is. Thank you. I, Lisa, if I didn't get that right, let me know in the chat. Um, someone's asking, do we have to transition to disabled adult child SSDI? And why would we if things are going fairly smoothly for years? Well, let's see. Am I going to go through the extra effort to open the car door if there's a $100 bill sitting there? It's more money. You've got more money. And the real benefit is when a parent passes, that child's going to be eligible for 75% of what you're entitled to. And the sooner you do it, the easier you make it, because the longer you wait, the harder it is to, you know, to go back all the way to 18 prior to 22 to get the records. It, it, there, money is the advantage for your child. That's the advantage is the money. You're walking away from money if you don't do it, even though it's a little bit of work. You know, you may have to spend 10, 15 hours on the process, but, you know, if, if you get a significant amount of money more, you know, per month, that's going to make a difference. Thank you. Uh, another question? My child is 21, sees a psychiatrist for medical management every three months. I should have her fill out some disability or specific disability form now. I, okay. I think documentation, and we were able to get full SSI at 18. Thank you, Tanya. Hey, the last part of that again. I'm sorry. Uh, he got SSI at 18. Right. With no issue. But she, I think she wants to know about the documentation and should she have the psychiatrist be completing any kind of form that helps to document? There's, the problem with Social Security is they have these forms tucked away. They're not standardized and used, unlike state disability. There's a doctor form, it's one page, the doctor fills it out, you're done. With Social Security, they want to see records. So what you want to do is make sure uh, that you have a record, the psychiatrist's record clearly articulates, you know, how the individual qualified for disability. So the fact that the child is on SSI, get the records that you got, you know, when it when the individual was approved, so that you have them if you need them at DAC. See, they if everything goes smoothly the way it's supposed to go, 
An SSI beneficiary who's granted at age 18 prior to 22, those records should be easy for Social Security to find and evaluate. The thing is the law changed and they're not allowed to, the term of art they use is adopt a prior decision. So just because they granted it in the past doesn't mean that they're going to auto grant it now saying, oh yeah, they qualified during that window of time we needed. No, they you have to get them to pull the file to get the records. That's why it's easier to maintain the records and submit it. It's never a form. There is no, so, you know, they have forms, but, you know, typically when I have a case where I need a form filled out, I have to work with disability determination services, which are the people that actually do the medical evaluation. And then I have to request them to provide me with the form. Then they provide me with the form, which oftentimes they're reluctant to. Uh, and then, you know, they'll say, okay, here's a form, but we want the records to go with it. So, you know, it's all about the records. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank, is it Amri Tasia, who is popping links in there in response to people's question at the uh, SSA website. So thank you for doing that. It's uh, very helpful. Um, okay, thanks for continuing disability documentation and future reviews. What is an effective way to document ongoing functional impacts of disability? Regular doctor appointments provide little time and opportunity for this, and it isn't helpful to speak in front of the impacted person. What ideas do you have? I have an idea that makes it easy. You negotiate with your provider that they'll accept a list from you. You know, at least you, you could set it up for four times a year. I don't know how often you're, you're going to these appointments where you actually don't use the term functional impairments you know, activities of daily living. Those are terms that don't mean anything. Talk about Johnny, you know, has difficulty when he's he's still having difficulty with blah, 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 blah. And then just ask him if they're willing to accept it and make it part of the record. Because that statement made by the parent, if it's given to Social Security directly, has, uh, it's an allegation, you're alleging the minute it goes into the record, very same statement, it's supportive documentation, which is being used as part of treating him, uh, treating him or her. So the best thing to do is negotiate with your doctor and say, is it okay if I give you a list of what's going on and you know what has changed and what's not changed? Still dealing with this, still dealing with this, you know, and and you have to also do the workaround of allowing or helping your child to see that you're just doing this, not as being negative, but trying to be able to maintain what you have. And you can do it in writing and hand it to the medical assistant and ask her to give it to the doctor before the doctor comes in so that you're not, you don't have to talk. That's what I do with the doctors when I don't want to talk negatively about Lauren's um, needs. Should we, there's a lot of questions about that. Should I just open up the Blue Book um, website so you can show people how they're doing this assessment? Are you talking about for uh, showing listing level of impairment yeah. and what is considered to be conditions that qualify? Yeah, please do. Okay, let me open up. Uh, okay, so this is, you go ahead and speak to now, it. So be aware. Look on the left, under Social Security, there's adult and child. In the world of Social Security, even though they're not consistent in how they use this, whenever we say child, it's under the age of 18. Okay? Even though we're calling the program disabled adult child. So whenever you look at a listing level of impairment, you want to go to adult. Okay? So let's go to 1,200 mental disorders. Okay, now if you scroll down, they specifically name out conditions and how, and then when you click on it, let's go to 12.05. No, you, there, there you go. Now, intellectual disorder satisfied by one, two, and three. You see how they specifically say one, two, and three, or satisfied by one and three. 
and they specifically let you know what the records need to be saying to be able to meet this listing level of impairment. Now, a listing level of impairment in this blue book, if an individual has it based on their records, is considered to be an automatic qualifier. So if you have a listing level of impairment, you want to make sure that it's documented, autism spectrum disorder, the, a medical documentation of both of the following. It's like a recipe, you know, and, and recipes are different, you know. And so, you know, the condition, you know, it's never diagnosis-based. If the one thing you all take home is do not use the word diagnosis when it comes to how they evaluate disability. We've got a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, but we need to meet A and B. <coughs> and under B, excuse me, extreme limitation of one or mark limitation of two. So as an example, number one under B is understand, remember, or apply information. Well, Saying that David has difficulty understanding and remembering is fine, but wh where is it documented and how is it documented in the medical record? You know, David, when being told to do something, will come back to me 15 minutes later and ask me what it was that I wanted him to do. That's just an example. You know, you, you want it to be clear as to what is going on with the individual. One follow-up question to the, they call this the blue book for everybody who's not right. seen it before. Um, and you can just Google ssa.gov blue book and this will pop right up for you. Is there advantages to having like a lot of people with autism also have concurring conditions, um, comorbidity, they may have anxiety issues. They also may have an intellectual disability. What's the advantage to listing all the conditions that they might experience? Yeah, so it's really important because you can qualify based on meeting a listing level of impairment, but that's not the only way. That's you're meeting an automatic qualifier, which is what the listing level of impairment um, is. You can have a combination of conditions, and then that's where Social Security pulls the records they review what, you're, what is being reported, they verify on the records that what is being reported is true, and then their doctor, social security doctor, not a consultative examiner, that are the uh, unprofessionals, in my opinion, that are contractors with social security that, that uh, you know, will do contract work, uh, spending 15 minutes with somebody and allegedly reviewing records and determining disability, I'm talking about specific medical providers, both psych and uh, medical, uh, that actually work for Social Security in disability determination services. And if they'll look to see if the information is there for a listing level of impairment or a combination of conditions still meet the criteria for not being able to work. The, the Social Security program, and I'll be doing this in another presentation, has what's called the five-step sequential evaluation process that everybody goes through when they review to determine if they're disabled or not. Um, so, you know, that's something I'll be going over. But if you find a condition in the blue book, it's really good that you keep that information. And sometimes I've even had doctors do a write-up, I'll assist a doctor in creating a letter uh, where we discuss the listing level of impairment and how that individual qualifies and make it a part of the of what Social Security receives. Thank you. Um, I have somebody that wrote something to the group about when the second parent retires, it's not an automatic change to the higher possible higher amount. So um, do what do people need to do when the second parent retires if it's the higher wage earner? It should not be that difficult of a process. You should be able to notify, you know, I'm I'm retiring, you know, my child is a DAC beneficiary on my spouse. 
you know, and then they should automatically go, well, nothing's automatic, but they should work through the system, you know, and make the correction. Okay. And is there any additional review of disability at that time? There should not be additional review unless, by coincidence, you have a normal continuing disability review that occurs. Okay. And you would be surprised at how many coincidences coincidences of where something occurred, a parent reports, and all of a sudden they get a continuing disability review and they're like, I knew it. The minute I would talk to them, they're gonna, they're trying to get me off the program. You know they're trying to get us off, and it's not true. No benefit is permanent. There is no such thing with Social Security as a permanent disability. That wording does not exist in the world of Social Security. That exists in private insurance, that exists in doctor's offices. You know, I have doctors all the time that like to write letters. You know, Susan is totally and permanently disabled and it impacts her ADLs. And I'm like, well, that doesn't help. What's going on? Why are you coming up with that conclusion? What is the symptoms? How does it manifest itself? How regular is are the symptoms? So, you know, everybody's gonna be medically reviewed and the medical review is not going to occur when you switch over to uh, a higher wage earner or a secondary parent um, going on to uh, uh, retirement. Thank you. All right, I'm dealing with the tail end of a uh, cold. <laughs> I'm so sorry. All right, uh, Jasmine, yes, there will be more webinars on SSI. And PHP will be posting those as they're scheduled. So you can always check the PHP website. Um, here's another I'm gonna be, Just so that you know, through Parents Helping Parents, the future includes working an SSI, working an SSDI, because they're two different sets of rules. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to develop uh, a case for disability. You know, how, what, is, what is the five-step sequential evaluation process is? Uh, and how do you meet listing level of impairment? Um, I'm going to be talking about five types of Medi-Cal um, so that people understand, you know, how the eligibility categories work. So that's just a, a, an example of some of the classes I'm planning on doing. Excellent. Thank you. And there already are some videos on the PHP eLearning website about applying for SSI. Um, here's another one, claiming an independent... Claiming an individual as a dependent can potentially impact a person's eligibility for a HUD voucher as the head of household. I don't think that's something Daniel covers and it's county to county. So thank you for that information because I uh, think it's important. Uh, next question. My son is 27, has received SSI since infancy and is unemployable. I will retire in about two years do I then apply for his SSDI? You cannot apply before you retire, but what you can do is dig for records and get those records in what I nicknamed the sweet spot, 18 prior to 22, whatever, and it's quality versus quantity. It's not about shipping Social Security a box of records. You can ship a simple one inch manila folder and have the evidence you need. You know, look to see you know, how your child meets the listening level of impairment, you know, and you have that all put together so that uh, when you do the application, you're not relying on them to call back for the record. You go ahead and give it to them, but you can't apply until you've retired. Thank you. Speaking of retirement, again, um, is there a disadvantage to early retirement if the fam or the parent is eligible at 62 or waiting till they're 70 or at full retirement age? Is there any impact? Um, you know, I, I hear different opinions on this, but you, you have to calculate. Okay, so if I retire at age 62, I get a certain dollar amount, but then 50% of that becomes what my child's getting. So that actually increases. Or is it worth it waiting until I hit my normal retirement amount and then get 50% of that, taking into account 
you know, inflation and the fact that these benefits go up. That's more of a, a Social Security retirement expert question as far as what is my best advantage at going at 62 as opposed to normal retirement or late retirement? When you have a disabled adult child, remember, we're talking about 50% of whatever you're entitled to. Thank you. And, and just for those of you in the process of anticipation of that, um, I retired at my full retirement age to get the clock ticking for the Medicare because Medi-Cal can have limits on what they're going to cover. So that that was the how I made the decision. All right, let's see if they are DCA, maybe that she meant DAC, I'm sure. Can they still accrue work credit towards SSI? How many credits do you need before they can collect Medicare? Okay, so SSI does not have work credits, okay? Work credits, when you do work activity, you're developing work credits, and if you're already a DAC beneficiary, you, you, you are, you know, you, you have to be careful because you could impact the DAC benefits and developing work credits for yourself uh, and ultimately could be eligible for an amount that's less than what you're getting off of DAC. So work credits is only a Social Security retirement and disability provision. It has nothing to do with supplemental security income. Thank you. And I'm sorry if I misunderstood the question. I, I think that covered it. If not, Debbie, let me know. Sorry, my daughter's calling me again. Um, do educational documents between 18 and 22, the IEP processes and their reports count toward documentation? It helps, but it depends on the licensing. So my standard is PhD MD. If I'm getting something from an LCSW or other type of social worker that do amazing work, um, it doesn't have the, the same level uh, when it comes to documenting. Thank you. Um, okay, that's a response. Regarding health insurance, folks on here who may be state or federal, federal employees, your child may qualify to continue your health insurance after 26 as an adult child incapable of self-support. Thanks, Irene, for sharing that. Um, yeah, that's something that the longer whatever mechanism you have that you're able to maintain the health coverage for a child that's private, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Because I tell people when you have private health insurance, you have more options, you know, and then Medi Cal becomes, you know, I'm sorry. That's my daughter. <laughs> she doesn't give up easily. Um, okay, I thought you. I don't know how to block her. I'm going to have to block her. Give me a second, you know. Uh, let me get the next question out. I thought you had to declare DAC on your SSA retirement application that starts the SSDI and Medicare countdown. My son is already on SSI for eight years since age 18. Are you the person asking that question? The countdown for Medicare begins the minute that they're DAC eligible, which would be uh, no sooner than your retirement, your disability, or God forbid your death. So the Medicare is only going to come about 24 months after that. Has no, a lot of people think, well, my person's on SSI, and shouldn't they be getting Medicare because they've been on SSI? No. SSI provides Medi-Cal. That's the only, in the state of California, it's automatic. Medicare is only provided from Social Security for an individual who is either age 65 and paid into the system, retired uh, and or uh, disabled. And then, you know, if you have a DAC beneficiary after 24 months. Thank you. I think this might be a legal question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. In regards to the previous question, I don't know which it was the previous. Uh, the parent has a higher wage. I won't retire for a few years. Dad is just retired and paid into Social Security. 
there is a special needs trust involved. Can my son get money from Social Security under his father that can be sent directly into the special needs trust? You know, you, I get that question all the time. A lot of people think, well, my child's getting benefits. Let's go ahead and deposit it directly into the special needs trust. First of all, it cannot go directly in. Secondly, it depends on the type of trust you have. The different types of trust have allowed different type of sourcing, my term, of where the funds come in from to go into the trust. So, and I'm not, I'm not going to get into first party, second party, third party, or 16th party, because that's not, you know, my area of expertise. And, and there's lots of opportunities to learn about that um, from different sessions on special needs trust. So um, you can call PHP and, and find out about that. Okay, where are we now? Uh, lost my place. Uh, I need more in-depth hand-holding class to apply for SSI for adult children with a disability. The high-level SSI webinar was not sufficient. Maybe you can talk about the services you provide, Daniel. Oh, you're talking about me. Okay, because I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, so was, I'm it was just this person needs more support. Okay, so if you need more support, I'm in private practice. Uh, my number uh, should be somewhere in what we put together. Um, I, um, you know, do offer one initial up to 20 minute call. Uh, after that, you know, I work, you know, I have a retainer and I work off retainer. Uh, and depending upon what help people need, some parents just need a little bit of help. You know, sometimes people will choose instead of going on retainer to go ahead and just book on my online site you know, and book an hour or book a half hour, you know, to go ahead and go over the issues. I'm all about empowering people. And when I work on a case, I advocate um, typically when it's needed. Uh, so it just depends on what's needed to be done on the case. Thank you. Um, question about the documentation and medical records. Um, is it going to be listed as the doctor's view or the parent's view? The medical record is always going to be the doctor's view. Unless the parent makes sure that their experience is captured in the medical record. You know, oftentimes when a people or an individual does not have, uh, you know, a disability that is uh, like being in a wheelchair or visually impaired or missing a limb or, you know, those things have to do with what's going on with the individual. How are they functioning? And oftentimes the providers are reliant on getting that information because in the little 15 minutes that they may have with you, that may not be enough time to get a, a true impression of what's going on with the individual. That's where if you're able to create, you know, notes that you provide the doctor, that's important. Yeah, and examples are really helpful too. Um, okay, do the documents, supporting documents need to be medical? Could they be progress report from independent living skills programs or community integration programs? Would that be helpful? Those could be helpful, again, depending on the licensing. Yeah, they're not. It depends. Like, are we dealing but... with PhD, MD? Are we dealing with LCSW? Because see, Social Security, although they do acknowledge the value, you know, of those kind of interactions and progress and what's going on, you know, oftentimes they're not at the level what some parents have done. will take those notes and get them put in the medical record. So now they become part of what the doctor is using to treat. And that same note now has a greater value. Thank you. Does a disabled adult child get either DAC or survivor benefits? Do we have a choice or is it always survivor benefits? Are survivor benefits 75% or 50% if one of the parents pass? Okay, 
if they're always going to work in the favor of the individual. So it's the higher highest wage earner, okay? Retirement disability, 50%. And then at death, it's 75%. So you could have two retired parents and a parent dies uh, and then the amount, you know, could it, it depends whatever is going to work in the best interest of the child. So the higher amount is always what you going to be the higher amount. And what's going to determine if it's survivors is if you have a parent that's died. Yeah. And Alice, I think your question was answered already. Um, once reporting the higher rate wage of the second spouse, is the excess amount retroactive? Uh, it, it potentially could be. It okay. potentially could be. Thank you. Some uh, Somebody's just saying thanks. Looking forward to the next seminar. Um, I already asked. Okay. There's a lot of conversation, a lot of response, a lot of chat here. Um, did you just say that Someone's child gets 50% of my payment. Not sure I understand that. Is this no. automatic? They get amount equal to 50% of your benefit. Example, you're eligible for 3,000. You get your full 3,000. And if your child meets disabled adult child criteria, they're also now eligible for an amount of 1,500 on top of what you're entitled to, because there's no, you, they're an adult. They're getting a benefits based on you as a record holder. All right, if my son will make more on SSI than 50% of my retirement very soon, would it make sense to actually wait till I die so he can get the 75%? No, because what you're doing, okay, if the amount that he would be entitled to is less than SSI, you can still get the SSI on top of it. If you're waiting till you pass away, then you're putting the onus on your heirs to retroactively go all the way back to 18 prior to 22. And remember, medical records disappear after seven years. Thank you. Um, if I retire at age 55, will my child still qualify, qualify for SSDI? You said 65 or 55? 55. No, because at 55, there is no Social Security. You could, you could retire at age 40, but there's no Social Security. The earliest you get is 62. And then at that event, you can get disabled adult child. I have parents that have retired some as many as 10 years earlier, but they weren't collecting Social Security. Therefore, there was no DAC benefit available because there wasn't an eligible parent. Thank you. I am currently on disability and will come to retirement age in July. Should I have contacted Social Security to get different coverage for my son? Um, if you're already on disability, if your child's above age 18, they should be on the Disabled Adult Child Program now. Now, when you hit your normal retirement age, there'll be a slight adjustment of your benefit. Uh, and then if your child's getting disabled adult child, they'll get the benefit of that slight increase. But if you're on disability right now, you need to do, you. I would recommend that you do the application for your disabled adult child uh, as long as they're over the age of 18 and you have the records prior to age 22. Okay. Um... This is a special needs trust question, but I think I might be able to point you in the right direction, Irene. Uh, with the special needs trust, there is language to address the Medicaid estate recovery. So that is what they call clawback. That is um, if they have money uh, and you know there's money left over and it's not in a trust, then Medi-Cal can come and snatch that money. Same for you if you end up as a senior on Medi-Cal in, in nursing care. So there is a um, agency or law office called Witherland, L-I-T-H-E-R-L-A-N-D and Associates. 
in Campbell, I think, and they do regular online presentations about that subject. Um, so it might be something worth looking into. All right, let's see. Would it be possible to get the chat? Um, you know, I will see if uh, PHP can mail out the chat. I don't know because people's names are in there and stuff. Uh, I, I don't know if that, well, that's just Well, this is, yeah, our, the chat amongst the group, not yours. Okay. There's lots of uh, responses to each other in here, so I'm sorting through, but we're getting down to only 11 questions. So my question was more focused on whether I have to declare my disabled adult child when I apply for retirement. Okay, I'm not sure what you're asking. Could you, could you clarify that, Debbie, in the chat and I'll get back to it? <laughs> yeah, you can say in the chat yourself. Okay. Um, here's a comment. Um, DAC benefits were recently increased by SSA for COLA, cost of living increase. However, the county reduced its benefits uh, for food stamps because he was receiving more money. This resulted in a net increase of $6 a month for his overall income. Can his food be subsidized by a parent or would that impact his DAC benefits or Medi-Cal? He receives DAC and Medicare Medi-Cal. So what you're talking about is that you want to assist a DAC beneficiary on Medi-Cal by buying them food. Yes. That's allowed. Okay, thank you. But that doesn't matter. That's only for SSI that they would look at that, I think. Correct. Under SSI provisions, they would. And please note that food stamps is another one of those payers of last resort. You know, if there's another way that you're entitled to something, they're not going to, you know, they're going to reduce what they pay you. Thank you. My child is now in his 30s. How do I get doctors to refer back to age 18 to 22? Your child is age 30. Uh, you Are they, well, my immediate question is, are they on benefits currently? And it's going to be very difficult to get records from that period of time. Now, I'll give you an extreme example of what I've been able to do. I had a family that didn't put their child on benefits, but they saved all the medical records. And I got a case granted with an onset to the 70s because they had records oh. from, the correct, from the correct period of time that had the level of detail needed. Now. When you do a late file, you're only getting a year's retroactive, but at least we got the DAC benefits in place. And this is a true story. That's amazing. That's why holding records are essential. Yeah. All right. My husband and I just retired at 62 and my daughter is getting more than 50% of his monthly check. They said she is getting it for what she could get if retired at full retirement age. Um, the problem is that she was disqualified for SSI and Medi-Cal. They told me now I need to apply for her Medi-Cal, but I need to know under what program she can qualify. We are paying that's, for private insurance. That, that is a worker giving you inaccurate information. Typical. When an individual is on SSI, and that individual loses SSI because of benefits from disabled adult child, they will get to keep their Medi-Cal as long as they continue to be eligible as a disabled adult child. The problem is there's a little button or a little checkbox that needs to be done by the SSI worker then that feeds to Medi-Cal so the Medi-Cal worker knows to enroll them in 6C for disabled adult child. So if anything, what needs to occur is that Medi-Cal needs to be contacted. They need to be told that, that they are a disabled adult child and should be under the aid code 6C. Thank you. 
All right, from one of my old, old, we go way back friends. Um, daughter has been receiving SSI since she was 10 years old. No work history. She is now 39 years old. Can she get Medicare if I retire? I'm now 66. Okay, if you retire and you have the evidence you need to show her as a disabled adult child between the ages of 18 prior to 22, yes, she becomes Medicare eligible after 24 months of being on disabled adult child. Thank you. A nice little thank you for your patience and knowledge. Um, we have an online appointment scheduled with SSA for survivor benefits for the widow and DAC. What information will I need to provide Social Security? Is it hard to get a hold of Social Security and get appointments? Do I need a professional on these appointments? Does the DAC need to be on that call? Okay, that's a lot of different questions. Yes. First of all, it's not easy to get through Social Security. It's not uncommon that I'll call a local office. I never call the 800 number, okay? Reason being that uh, an example of how bad the 800 number can be, when they pass the Medicare Part D plan, I used to do trainings in Hawaii for different AIDS organizations, and people were calling the 800 number about the Part D plan, and they were told not once, but a couple of times that Hawaii wasn't part of the US. So it doesn't apply to them. So the 800 number has not, in my experience, been very reliable. Now, getting an appointment can be challenging with the local office, and you have to be willing to sit on the phone for an average of an hour and a half to be able to get through to anybody. That's if after the first half hour, they don't disconnect you. It's just the way things are right now. Um, it's pretty crazy. Now, to go in and do the appointments, you don't necessarily have to have somebody with you. You just need to have everything in alignment of where you need to be. You know, so if you're doing as a survivor a DAC benefit, is this somebody who's on SSI? And if so, do you have the records from the window of proof of 18 prior to 22? And you go ahead and bring them in with you. Um, and I think I addressed, I think there were three questions in there. Do I need a professional on these appointments? You don't, you don't necessarily have to have a professional. I don't physically go in. And the reason I don't physically go in, because everything I do, believe it or not, I do it via fax. And the reason I do it via fax is they have a system when you fax something to the local office, it's called work track and it's date stamped, it doesn't go into a scan stack, it's already stamped and it's electronic. And if there's ever a question, I say, well, you show that you received it in work track, such and such a day, such and such a time. When I, when I physically interact with them, either over the phone or I've done it in person, I don't have the guarantee to make sure that what they're asking for is getting processed. That's just my experience. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think that we got it covered. If there was other question we didn't get to, let us know. Um, if the parents are divorced and the ex-spouse is getting money based on the other spouse because he or she was the higher wage earner, does this impact DAP? Is there only so many ways to slice the pie? I love that. <laughs> no, I, I, I have divorced parents where the wage earner is uh, separate from the parent that has the child, and uh, they're getting the child's getting benefits based on that parent. So, if there's three adults getting benefits, that there could be three adults, and the family maximum kicks in. Okay. If it's off of one record holder, and you find out the family maximum from Social Security directly. Okay. Because everybody's family maximum is different. What if one of the parents is passed and it's the 75% benefit split three ways? That's so if the parent is passed, you you basically provide them the evidence and then they 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 base it off of that parent's record. Okay. 
the benefits. There's three them. disabled adults, and I'm not sure if these are children that are the three people that are disabled, or if it's a parent and two disabled adults. Could you clarify? And I'll re-ask this. We're almost done with questions. If I want to keep Kaiser through Santa Clara Valley Health Plan, how can I keep it after getting SSDI? Does my son have to get on Medicare, which might eliminate Kaiser? I can answer that because if your child's already a Kaiser member, they will accept Medi-Cal while you're waiting for Medicare to cook, kick in. And then you would have both and you could do it that way as well. Right, and Kaiser, is also what's called a Medicare Advantage plan. Mm -hmm. So for its members who are met or soon to be members who want Kaiser who are Medicare eligible, you just select them as the Medicare Advantage. That's one of yeah. the very straightforward. It is fair. I had to do that and it was a breeze. I was told that when you had to do I was told that you had to declare your DAC when you applied for retirement online with SSA. Okay, I'm not sure what the question is. I think you there is, you have there to is a checkbox that do you have a disabled adult child? There is a question on that application right. when you apply. That's right, and that misleads people to think that that's all I needed to do, and there's not going to be a medical review. So you let them know that you have a disabled adult child, and then they begin the medical review process, or they should. Thank you. And this question was asked or uh, answered earlier, but I'll ask it again because somebody still needs to know. If disabled adult child is getting Medicare and Medi-Cal, do you still need to keep the assets under 2000 to remain Medi-Cal eligible? That no longer is in place. You can have up to 130,000. Thank you. I'm retired and my son got SSDI. Should I continue to work to get more money uh, or to get more social security for my son when I retire? Okay. Is your son, okay, say it again. I'm sorry. Okay. She wants to know her husband is already retired and the son is getting disabled adult child benefits. Should she continue to work to continue to? have maybe additional monies through social security for her child when she retires. That would come into play if you're the higher wage earner. Because if you're not the higher wage earner, it's only going to impact your benefit. If you're the higher wage earner, yeah. If you want to continue working and get a benefit uh, you know, in the future, that's fine. Thank you. My disabled son is 33. I recently got a random interview from Social Security for him. They sent me a letter asking for a rental agreement between him and me. They wanted to know all of our expense, our family monthly expenses. I wasn't sure of utilities and want to make sure he doesn't lose any of his monthly income. Can you please advise for how to keep the amount he is receiving? How much should his monthly expenses be for housing and living? So that whole question is all SSI. Yes. It's all SSI. So supplemental security income pays a benefit based on need. They look if the individual has any income, whether it's given to them by Aunt Susie monthly or if it's from Social Security Disability Insurance. So those are the first reductions. And then they do what's called in-kind support and maintenance. And what they do is they evaluate if the individual is paying their fair share of food and shelter or responsible for their own food or shelter before determining the SSI benefit for that individual. So what occurs is if you're not paying the full amount that you're responsible for, um, you know, in the household, uh, then they'll attribute a value to that, which is called in-kind support and maintenance. And the in-kind support and maintenance maximum they reduce is 304.66 per month. So there's two ways to respond to this SSI specific question that you can go 
when they're doing this is a financial continuing disability review. They're evaluating for SSI purposes, and they do this every calendar year for SSI. And because it's happening in March, they're probably running late in that office. They're evaluating what is your child responsible for? Are they getting free room and board? Are they responsible? Now, this is a mistake parents make. They'll say, okay, we're going to rent Johnny a room because our mortgage is 15000 a year and there are only three adults and one third of that would be $5,000 and that's way more than the SSI they're entitled to. But we're going to rent him a room in Silicon Valley for $500 a month. Social Security will say, okay, fine. Would you rent that room to somebody else for that 500? Oh no, we would charge $3,000. Well, eh, they're gonna go ahead and say, they're gonna attach a value and reduce the benefit dollar for dollar, not to exceed 300 and, what is it? 304.66, sorry, I'm looking at my cheat sheet. So the way what you do it is- What if they call it is, room and board, Daniel? What if they call it room and board and it's- Room and board is referred to as, is, what are you paying to live physically where you live? And board means the food, okay? So in this situation, you know, what is the amount that the individual is responsible for to live there and to eat there? Now, the way my families often will deal with this is they'll open up, and we'll be talking about this in another training, an ABLE account, A-B-L-E. And an ABLE account, uh, basically is the, you know, instead of them changing the national law, which is from the 60s of $2,000 in the bank, they created a new law for the disabled community who had disabilities prior to age 26, where you can contribute whatever that year's maximum amount is up to $100,000. Now, the beauty of these ABLE accounts, when I have a child who has a disability and you only have to self-report, before age 26 is that I have parents who literally will charge a child $1,000 a month to live in the room and $500 for food, and that's an example. And then they fund the ABLE account so that the ABLE account is used to pay mom and dad the difference of what needs to be paid from the social security to meet those obligations. Then the parents turn around and put that money back into ABLE if they haven't reached their maximum. And I nickname it SSI money laundering <laughs> under the ABLE Act. <laughs> because what you're doing is you're taking a scenario and you're making it work by the way you're funding things so that your child gets the full SSI amount for SSI and doesn't get reduced for in-kind support and maintenance. So whenever they're doing these reviews, they're going to say, oh, do you have a rental agreement? Okay. How much is the child responsible for? Are they paying one-third of the expenses, one-fifth of the expenses? They're always looking at adults, not other children. And how much are they responsible for food? And if anybody contributes to food or shelter, or they're not paying their fair share, then they're going to get reduced the SSI benefit. And I probably went off on three different subjects. Sorry. <laughs> All right. We have uh, 12 minutes left. <clears throat> Who has to change the 6C code to make sure it's right for the SSI to Medicare disabled adult child benefits change? Is it SSA or the Medi-Cal worker? SSA doesn't know how to do it. They're supposed to trigger, and I worked with them years ago, but then they stopped doing it, what's called the 1634C provision, which is the provision under SSI rules that allow it. Now what you have to do is work with Medi-Cal directly. So you have to communicate with Medi-Cal and verify what is the eligibility category that the individual is on and make sure they're transitioned over to the disabled adult child. And Irene, I'm right there with you. I asked him that question before we started, and I have to do the same thing. They put and she got an earful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got a couple more here. 
If I am not eligible for SSDI, will my 19-year-old son still qualify for DAC? No, because if, well, SSDI or are you eligible for retirement? Because SSDI, all that is, is Social Security Disability. That's saying that you're able to access your retirement early because of disability. Thank you. So it, it's from the retirement pot. So if the question is, I don't pay into Social Security, no. If you do pay in, it would occur not when you become disabled, when you retire. Thank you. But you have to pay in, you know, example. Two school teachers, child with a disability, they stopped paying into Social Security 15 years ago. They both retired. Their retirement system doesn't provide for a disabled adult child. We could only do an SSI claim. I'm going back to the pie. There are three disabled adults over the age of 19 in that household. How does that family maximum apply? Well, three different jobs. No, three different disabled adults over the age of 19. When we're asking about how you can split the pie, how much can you split okay. it? So you have to find out from Social Security what your household family maximum is. Okay, so there's going to be a family maximum and they'll be able to let you know what each individual who's under that record holder. They're, and I they're just had a friend who turned 70 and she finally filed for her own social security. She did not get benefits through her husband so that the funds were there for her twin daughters. So there, you know, she just waited till she turned 70 to take her benefits and didn't get money from his so that the girls got both of them. All right, I'm, we have an interview coming up Friday. Does our adult child with Down syndrome still relate to our income? I'm not sure what, could you, could you define that for me, Don? That's Don. Uh, what's the best way to apply, online or in person? I called and was holding for a long time, probably need to reschedule the appointment. I recommend faxing everything in because I have had people who do interviews with workers who have varied skill set amounts and ask the same questions and get the same answers and mark it differently. That's just my experience. So I find using, um, you know, if, if you've got a good office and you've got a good worker, it should be pretty straightforward them doing a DAC application. But mind you, once you switch over to DAC from SSI, the the two thousand dollars in the bank, one house, one car, uh, all those rules end. Thank you. Is the DAC benefits ever impacted by a special needs trust money, either a first or a third party trust? No, it's not, because the DAC benefits are not needs based. What could be impacted is depending upon the distributions, the Medi-Cal. Thank you. And Maria, you got that code for 6C for the Medi-Cal. Um, I saw somebody responded to your question, and that's for the qualification under disabled adult child. Okay, let's see. Trudy, we don't have power or stable internet, and I think I missed the answer to my question on having to report my DAC when I file for retirement online. Did Daniel say yes or no? Did I say yes or no to what? I apologize. Uh, that's okay. Um, Debbie, yes. He said yes. You will check that box that you have a child with a disability who may be eligible for benefits, but it's up to you to make sure that happens. And you still have to do an application. Checking that box is not an application. What that triggers them to do is to mail you one. Exactly. And let me ask you that because, you know, when I first met you, I don't know, decades ago now, um, you had encouraged people to do the online app. I know we used to have brown hair when we met. Um, <laughs> you used to encourage people to do it online because you could put a lot more information in the online application. 
it's not i don't find it to be advantageous okay to do it online i find in my practice to get things done and to make sure things aren't lost i just do everything on paper okay. and i fax it in i don't physically take i don't i don't encourage my people to physically take things in okay. i i'm i live in the old school of facts you know, and for people who don't have faxes, it's not that expensive to buy an online fax program that'll allow you to fax. And, and fax really, zero will let you send a free fax. Huh? Fax zero, Z E R O. You can send a free fax. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't know that. Pro, I don't know the program. Okay. Um, but it's. It's. I just. That's my experience and what works the best. Okay. Sangeetha's asking, does the child need to be on the interview? No. Okay. But you need their signature. Unless you they're conserved. Uh, for the application, unless they're conserved. And then if they're conserved, you know, you sign and then provide the conservatorship paperwork. Thank you. And Moira, it's disabled adult child. That is what DAC stands for. We did that earlier, but perhaps you came in after that. Okay, already answered, Sikita. Um, if a special needs trust owns a house with the DAC, Disabled Adult Child Beneficiary Pays Rent To, does the amount of the rent impact eligibility for Medi-Cal or food stamps? Uh, I can't answer food stamps. That's not my area. Um, it's not going to impact DAC. It's so a special needs trust. It shouldn't impact the, the individual is paying rent to live in a home that is owned by the special needs trust. That shouldn't impact anything. I don't know about food stamps, though. Okay. Well, it is six or six. It's eight twenty-six, and um, this is how you applaud uh with your hands so applause to daniel um uh, you know his brilliance always amazes me i've heard him speak i don't know like 30 40 times always learn something new uh, daniel you're amazing that you are willing to do this and 